This may just be the best deal you can get in a camera right now. Hey everyone, Camber here back with you and today we are talking about the a7 III and why this may just be the best deal you can get in a camera right now. And if you're new here, this channel is all about teaching you how to use your camera to make good videos. So if that's you, consider subscribing. And a quick disclaimer, I'm not saying this is better than cinema cameras. This is the DSLR realm, so there you go. Now, I got this about a month and a half ago to replace the A7S Mark II that I'm shooting on right now. And so far, I've used this in a wedding. Like the results, you can check out the whole video if you want here somewhere. I just took it last week to Europe and uh, shot a bunch of vlogs throughout London and Paris. Those will be coming out soon as well. But this thing, it just blows me out of the water. I'm going to be telling you mostly uh, upgrades that it has from the A7S Mark II, but also if you're coming from a different brand, why this may be a good idea to switch. I've got links in the description for the A7 Mark III, so you can check that out while you're watching the video. So the first thing you'll notice if you're coming to this from one of the original A7s or from the Mark II versions, that the grip is much bigger, the whole camera is a little bit bigger, and that's mainly due to bigger battery. A7S Mark II battery, A7 III battery. You can see right there, it's much bigger. Mirrorless cameras are known for having bad battery life because of small batteries. Sony fixed that right here, huge improvement. Next up is dual memory card slots. Even has a nice little door here. Pops open, UHS-2 slot on the bottom, UHS-1 slot on the top, door shuts, clicks easy. Not sure why they couldn't make both of them UHS-2, but nevertheless, it's still a nice improvement because now that gave me a great peace of mind shooting a wedding, being able to record to two cards in case one of them failed. They added a USB-C port to the side of it, so those of you like me who have the new MacBook that only has the USB-C ports in it, now I don't have to carry this thing around with me everywhere. I can just unhook the plug from the power outlet, stick it on my camera, transfer the files, stick it back and start charging my computer again. So really nice addition there, and you can also charge off of it. Next up is the addition of the touch screen, which doesn't work for the menus, but it's really nice for focusing because with most mirrorless lenses, they're electronic focus motors. So trying to do any kind of racking focus is pretty difficult to get it spot on, even with focus peaking. So being able to touch what I want to focus on was really nice throughout the whole time. Or even using a gimbal when I was doing sliding moves, I could touch my initial point, slide over, touch the finishing point when I want it, and it worked really great and I didn't have to spend multiple times trying to get that focus just right. So I added a joystick here which I really don't use much. It's useful in menus but if you like it, cool. Next improvement is APS-C in 4K. Before in the A7S Mark II you couldn't crop in to the APS-C mode when you're in 4K. Now they fixed that and you can so that's a nice option to have. So next up is 120 frames per second with no cropping in on the sensor. With the A7S Mark II, you could shoot at 60 frames per second with using the full frame sensor, but as soon as you went to 120, it would crop in, and so you'd have to change your lens in order to get the same equivalent focal length that you had at 60 frames per second. But now they fixed that, you've got the full frame with 120 frames per second, so you can just leave the same lens on there, switch back and forth really easily. They've changed the placement of the record button to here. It used to be on the side of the A7S Mark II, it makes more sense there. It's easy to push. You know you pushed it. It's not hard to find. So good improvement there. So if you're coming from a different company, one of the complaints with these Sony cameras is that the menus are ridiculous. And yes, there are a lot of them. This one has 35 pages of menu settings. Part of the reason for that is that there's so much customization. There are so many great video options for this that it's definitely worth it. So aside from the custom one, two, three and four buttons, you can customize just about every other button on this camera. So you don't even have to dig into the menus to change the settings that you need. But one of the things they did improve on the menus with this camera is that at the end of them, there's a customized menu where you can go in and take the settings that you wouldn't set to any of your custom buttons and then set that in your own custom menu. So you just go straight to that menu, change the things that you'd normally need to do like formatting your card, so if you're coming from a different camera manufacturer like Canon, this thing has focus peaking, which is quite useful for manual focusing. It has a marker display, so if you plan on using any kind of letterboxing on your videos, you can have those markers on the screen and see what your shot's gonna look like. 
It has a five axis stabilized sensor. So instead of having to buy lenses with image stabilization, you can just use any lens and the camera will compensate stabilization based on the focal length you're using. And if you're using Sony glass, it will automatically detect which focal length you have and stabilize as necessary. But if you have any other kind of brand that you're using an adapter with, you can go in and manually choose your focal length so that it will stabilize correctly based on the focal length you're using. So they added a setting called S and Q, and that stands for slow and quick. So you can switch to that, get slow motion, or you can have it set to get a time lapse. You can go as low as one frame per second, but it really isn't that great for doing time lapses and that's what leads me into the first downfall of this camera is that you don't have access to get applications on the camera anymore. On my a7s mark ii I download the time lapse app because I use time lapses all the time. I get them everywhere I go and it's really nice having the flexibility to change the length of time your time lapses to change the style and the look of how you do them and this camera is very limiting on how it does that. So even though this does almost everything I want, I still have my A7S Mark II body with me so that I can get those time lapses when I want them. And the only other downside for me that this camera has is it still has the same old flip screen that just tilts up and down. It is nice for shooting handheld, being able to look down at the camera like this to it. I can have the camera on the ground and still see the picture just fine. Or if I have it up high on a tripod or monopod or gimbal, can tilt it down and still see my picture well. So it is useful, but as far as vlogging goes or times like this where I wanna see what's going on in the camera, being able to maybe have this extend further and flip straight up so you could see yourself would be nice or an extra hinge on the side so it could flip out. And of course the A7S Mark II is great in low light. It's one of the best low light cameras out on the market right now. And this camera has twice as many megapixels so it's not as good in low light. However, it still does quite well. So if low light is your thing, if you really need the best performance, then definitely the A7S Mark II would still be the way to go. But I find myself trying to light my stuff as best as I can and this thing did just fine throughout my whole wedding video. And one of the best things about this camera is that it is only $2,000 for the body, which may sound like a lot of money, but the A7S Mark II cost me $3,000 and this thing improves on almost everything that the A7S Mark II can do. This camera is great. I definitely suggest getting it if you're looking to upgrade, switching from another manufacturer. It is definitely worth it. Got links below for you so you can check that out. And also if you want to see that wedding video, you can see it up again. I'll leave some links for it. And that's all. So if you made it this far, go ahead and hit that thumbs up and let me know down below if you have any more questions about this camera or its capabilities. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't, and remember that the only way to get better at something is to practice. So get out there and film something. See you soon.